do this both things at once. So I apologize. I will um, start over at which I hadn't gotten very far. So definitely I appreciate that. You could probably even type it in the chat and I would see it. <laughs> but anyway, so the environmental ethics class is a philosophy class. Many people think that philosophers are detached from real life. They just sit and weave out theories and they're very abstract and they just talk to each other. It has nothing to do with my life, right? I wanna to try to convince you how false that is. I wanna to try to convince you that you cannot understand what you see in front of your eyeballs unless you study the ideas behind the culture that are driving human behavior. They're driving not only the way, they're driving the behavior because they're controlling what people think. And people are thinking, uh, are acting on the basis of how they think. So this class is about the history of how people think about the natural environment and our relationship to it. And that is the only way to explain why scientists all agree climate change is real, it's human caused, it's, it's terrible, it's, it's snowballing, we gotta stop this. And there's so much resistance there's denial, there's defiance, there's ignorance, there, I mean, every possible resistance. Like, why is this huge gap between the way people think and the way they feel and the way they act and what is actually going on, even right in front of their face? That's why philosophy is important. That's why I think it's at the root of human history, human culture, and especially the environmental problems. So that is what I'm going to teach you in this class. The first part of the class is going to talk about the West, not because I think the West is superior, not because I'm an American, but because the development of science, technology, and industry in the West, is imp it's important to understand those roots because what happened is it established certain paradigms for the way people think. And many Americans still think this way and they are at the forefront of destroying the environment and not changing. You must read these texts to understand that. Um, so that is why the first five weeks or so are about the West and the Enlightenment project, the modern science and its aftermath. The second section of the class is about religion. Westerners during the Enlightenment, throughout religion, they set up this huge gap between religion and science, which is what we read with Bacon. That was a false uh, split. Ancient religions were not anti-science. They were, they were, a, they had a, a science that was more holistic, more interactive, and we were, so, and they set up cultures that were sustainable you had to figure out how to integrate culture and nature. So the ancient societies were much more into integration, whereas the modern world came along and it was exploitation is the new model. So we'll go back to the religions. Each of you can decide if you think the religion is religion in general or the tradition you grew up with is hopelessly dated it's way too anti-science. I don't want anything to do with it. Or if you think it has the same values, it has the values and the idea of God is more powerful than we are. Those basic foundations of your religion 
are a good foundation for integrating science and religion. You can go either way. You can go any number of ways. And so this class just gives you the opportunity. I just present some readings in the, I think they're respectable scholars. Uh, nobody agrees on everything, but I think most of what I teach is not controversial. And then you wrestle with it. And then the third section is about specific issues like the loss of species, um, uh, overpopulation, uh, pol pollution, climate change, uh, just some specific. There's many, many issues. We just focus on a few of them. And then people's attitudes at this point, um, the tragedy, the commons, lifeboat ethics, there's some other basic attitudes. So with every class, your final paper is going to be about my environmental ethic. What is my way of thinking about nature, culture, the relation between nature and culture, and human reason? What is human reason and how should we use it? What's the best way to live a rational life or are you going to be anti-rational and think we have to live a religious life, not a rational life? But to me, the linchpin is how you understand the word reason. Um, all right, so paradigm shift. Aristotle understood, here's the paradigm from the ancient view to the modern view in the West. Aristotle's virtues are based on the mind. I will, reason is not, that's such an ambiguous word. So reason as mind, nous, that's the ancient view, okay? That was tied to the moral virtues, the political virtues, and then the intellectual virtues, and they had to be tied to a strong character, okay? So knowing how to deliberate, if you are wise, you can figure out a situation and you know what's best. Now, when it comes to environmental issues, people are deliberating about this, uh, you know, totally ramped up on steroids, right? Okay, how are we gonna get societies to adapt to these changes? How are we gonna get people to develop good habits that lead to sustainability. So that's what I was talking about before. Children get habituated. How are we gonna habituate children? How are we gonna convince adults who have been corrupted by their habits to change their mind, change their idea of the good and of flourishing and get them to think about what kind of life do I want for my children and grandchildren and not allow them to deny it, right? Or ignore it. How are we gonna do this? Those are all issues of deliberation. And then what sort of intellectual training? How do we teach math, science, engineering in a way that's tied to the values of sustainability and the facts about sustainability? So that's um, the Aristotelian model Aristotle's model is still relevant because the United Nations uses this capabilities model, which is very Aristotelian. I've said that before. And even though the United Nations officially has this doctrine about human rights, I'm going to talk one last time about John Locke and his creation of this doctrine of rights. And originally, that doctrine of rights involved exploiting nature indefinitely. So the UN originally doesn't mention uh, the right to clean air, clean water, nothing like that. That was not the origin of the original rights concepts. 
And in 1945, it still wasn't a big issue. Today, it is. And the UN has come up with numerous documents uh, promoting the right to a decent environment, the right to a stable natural environment uh, for one's children and grandchildren. Um, so, all right, next step. So then we have, I did, there's a whole video on that class. Then um, this is Galileo and Bacon. Let me see. And there's the YouTube channel so that you can get that. All right. So here is the documents this we covered last time that many of you were not here. So let's focus in on this. Um, this is the beginning. Here's one brief page of my objectives. So in the syllabus, AUW requires professors to have objectives. Those are generic objectives, critical thinking, doing research, uh, writing, right? And I explain how my class develops those. But I also have specific objectives for each class related to the content. Why do you have to read this material, right? And hopefully also why you read it this particular day, you know, after this one and before that one, because I want them all to fit together. This is not a textbook class. This is a class based on classics. These are books that have had a profound impact on human history. That's why they're called classics. They also are documents that, that appeal to a capacity for thinking that's universal. Anybody can really understand these arguments. And you don't have to be a genius. And you, you don't have to have a lot of formal training. That's why they're classics. They have a broad appeal. OK, so that's why um, it's important that I link these together and that you watch the videos or come to class to make sure you understand the relationship between these documents, because it's not a textbook class. It's not going to feed you that stuff right away. OK, so we talked about Francis Bacon. He, his book, and I have some excerpts, and I'll just scroll down those in a minute, is called The New Organon. OK, before Bacon, for thousands, hundreds of years, well, from like 300 BC until what, 1600, this is a long time. Uh, Aristotle's worldview, Aristotle's science dominated the West. And it was, it was really a lot like ecologists at this point. He thought everything is connected to everything. Human beings evolved within this context of an ordered world they gradually, their brains got bigger and more sophisticated. Their societies got sophisticated. They started having more complex problems to solve. And all of a sudden, they realize that what they're doing to solve these problems is creating patterns. And so the goal is to understand the universe, not to control it. That was Aristotle. Bacon says, no. The purpose of scientific knowledge is power. The point is to gain power over nature, but always for human well-being, OK? So Aristotle's science did not enable us to make progress, to develop, to improve um, our, our, the quality, the material standard of life. We can exploit the natural world. People can be healthy. They can be happy. They can be protected from um, all those, what, the weather, the diseases. Um, and they can get 
higher levels of education, all sorts of higher quality of life for people, okay? And God wants us to do that. God gave us the natural world, ordered, and gave us reason, and we're supposed to exploit nature. Aristotle was wrong, okay? We're never going to get anywhere if we keep with Aristotle. So he wrote the new organon. All right. Then I will also talk about the idols of the, the four idols in Bacon, where he's basically saying, forget everything you ever learned. <laughs> We're starting all over from scratch. And he talks about the difference between God's will, God's power, science and religion are not, they do not have to be split, okay? Even though they were in the minds of many Westerners. And then he talks about the ants, the spiders and the bees. And so I'll talk about that too. Okay, before the bacon, Quote, I do have Galileo. You don't have to read the section on Galileo, but the idea is that he was a scientist. Uh, there was lens grinding became a skill. Um, people were professionals at grinding glass and making lenses. So he couldn't have a magnifying glass. So he figured out he could study the motions of the uh, heavenly bodies more specifically and he figured out that the earth is round and that the earth rotates around the sun and rotates on its axis so they start getting this knowledge well that contradicted the catholic church and actually aristotle would have agreed okay aristotle would have agreed with the discoveries of the scientists the Catholic Church claimed to be Aristotelian and was threatened by it. And that's why Bacon says the new organon chucked the whole thing. That's when there became this animosity and this stereotype. Religion is over here and science is over here. Reason is over here and faith is over here. None of that had to happen. You don't have to... So you can, it's fine with me, however you end up. All I'm telling you is it's problematic. Do not assume there's only one position. There's many different positions. Okay, so that's Bacon. The next one is Locke. Locke is the one who introduced, he has a book called The Second Treatise on Government, published in 1688, and his main emphasis was on natural rights. So he gives you this whole way of thinking about rights. And at the time, he lived in England, there was a monarch, a king, and there was an aristocracy that inherited land, estates. He wanted to blow that all up. He wanted to have democracy. He wanted a society based on a constitution, on the rule of law, all right? Aristotle talks about this. So again, this is not new, but they made it appear to be new, okay? Um, so the rule of law, the laws are based on this belief that everybody is born free and equal and they have natural rights. And, and I will go through this whole chart that gives you a mindset. So my goal is that in the first hour of this class, maybe hour and 15 minutes, we will focus mostly on lock. And you, can, and you will get into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes to talk about your thoughts about what I say about luck. So please pay attention. And if you don't get it, just listen to somebody else. 
But while I'm talking, try to think of something that you would like to bring up in your groups that's positive, that would contribute to the group. And if you have other problems, just wait till after class and you can talk to me. So, so Locke is replacing, a, the king does not have a divine right. He doesn't speak for God. The nobility does not have a right to inherit land. The people who have a right to land are people who work work up the land, give it value, trade their, you know, they, they plant corn and they trade their corn for candles or shoes or something, and they create wealth. They use the land to create wealth, to create prosperity. Those are the people with the right to the land, not the people who inherited it, okay? Big issue for him. Um, also, the citizens have a right to rebel against leaders who are corrupt, okay? And that was very, very radical at the time. Um, Locke understood the corrupting power of greed. Aristotle said greed is the political vice. It's what ruins political community. It ruins society. He condemned the creation of money. He want societies on the barter system. That is not the society we have now, right? We have this international corporations, but we still have the mindset in America. Millions of Americans still have this mindset of I have a right to whatever I wanna do with my property. I have a right to pollute. If polluting uh, enables me to make a product that I can sell in the market, I have a right to pollute the water. I have a right, but it, you know, I have a right to do with my land whatever, as long as I'm making something valuable, meaning money <laughs> that, that I can exchange in the marketplace. And nobody, the government cannot tell me what to do. So the U.S. has a minimal government intervention model. I do not think your countries have that. But you need to, you know, be alert. Think about what is your country's model of political authority? Plus, how much does your country defer to the United Nations? The United Nations is very concerned with climate change. And so they have a very different model from the American model, which is ironic since the United Nations was created in America. But Americans, many Americans despise the United Nations to a level that in other countries is simply not true. This is very important. Your life is at stake. Your country is affected by this. Um, Adam Smith was dealt with the economic system. So in the economic system, these people with inherited wealth would control the parliament. There was a house of nobles. They automatically belonged to the house of nobles. They made the laws. They made the laws to protect their own interests and their own wealth. So if some landed estate owner had grapes and made wine, even though it wasn't very good wine, but he had sort of a monopoly in England on the wine. He wanted to have a huge tariff on the French wine coming in because French wine was a heck of a lot better because the weather was better, but he didn't want that. So he kept this monopoly by having the parliament make laws to have a tariff, right? Adam Smith says, forget it, have a free market. No tariffs, let the Scottish people raise sheep in that weather, make wonderful sweaters, sell them to the French. Let the French make wine because the weather there is perfect for grapes. Sell it to the British. Get rid of all this mercantilism, right? A free market. Adam Smith 
was also worried about greed. He wanted children to be raised to live moderately and not to want more than their share because he knew greed was a political evil. Greed would ruin societies. That you need to know that because today, many, many business people in America refer to Adam Smith, the free market, John Locke, the free property rights. They just hammer and hammer. Someone can tell them, but we're destroying life on earth. They do not hear it. They say it's a hoax. So it, that's why I do think you must need to know this mindset. Um, Donald Trump plays to it also. He agrees with them just in order to get votes. All right, so these were the readings of Galileo and Bacon. Just so you did have some original texts and you know, these were like the Bible, you know, these were the cultural books people embraced to, to formulate their culture. So the idols of the, there's four idols. The idols of the tribe are all the, that man is the measure. It's the limit to what human beings take in with their senses and understand. There's a lot more out there. The idols of the tribe are whatever humankind, you know, thinks collectively at that point in time. The idol of the cave is each individual person lives in their own cave and they're exposed to certain things and not other things. The idol of the marketplace is that people go down into the marketplace or they go onto social media and they hear something and they believe it. And then the idol of the theater is when you have a whole philosophy, like the philosophy of Locke or the philosophy of Aristotle or the philosophy of the Catholic church. And they just embrace that. And Bacon is saying, forget all of that. Just forget it. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna, oh, on religion, he said, Reading the Bible is about God's will, how we ought to act, our moral uh, virtues. Whereas studying science is understanding God's power, right? God had the power to create nature. And so we are supposed to, we have a moral obligation to exploit that power and help people, not to be greedy, not to take advantage of people, but to help people. So he, he did not think religion and science had to be split, but he had his certain view of what the relationship was. And finally, his model of science is that the ants just collect data, fact after fact, and they never make it into knowledge. The spiders are the Thomas who know everything about everything. And I talked about this in the last video. And so any sort of fact, new fact, just gets put right in that spider web and explained so that, so that you never have to change. Whereas Bacon says the bees collect the pollen, the facts, and they make it into honey, that's knowledge. So, the honey is substantially different than the pollen, right? So the bee makes facts into knowledge. And that is our tool for improving the material conditions of human life. Then I have a document where I pretend that I'm Galileo and Bacon, and I take some of the interesting quotes. So if you want to look at that document, fine. Um, then there's this document, Lock on Property. And last time I was going through this and there, was, there were one or two students for whom the light bulb just went off and they go, oh my gosh, this is important. Ah, if you could all just understand that, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, but he's quoting also from the Old Testament, which the Quran has these characters in it. It has a lot of the same stories. 
So, um, so the, I think that's really interesting. And we will go into the book of Genesis and interpretations about what that means for our relation to nature. But this one is just referring to Adam uh, in terms of property, <laughs> property rights. So, um, okay, here is the notion of reason. God gave us the earth in common, but also reason. So this is a different idea than Aristotle, okay? For Aristotle, mind. Reason means mind. For Locke, reason means calculating how to, how to become as economically prosperous as you can. So it's a kind of strategizing. It's, a, it's um, yeah, calculating the most efficient means to your material well-being, the best advantage of life and convenience. The earth and everything in it is given to us to support our existence, okay? All the fruits, all the animals uh, belong to humankind in common, right? This is free and equal, um, but they're given for the use of men. So of course, animals don't have intrinsic value or rights. Of course, the natural world has no intrinsic value and no rights. And according to God, okay, it's God's will that we manipulate nature for our well-being because we are special in the eyes of God, right? We were created in the image of God. Okay, everybody has property. My body is my property. I have a right to my life. No other person can threaten my life. I have a right to my health. No other person can threaten my health. I have a right to my possessions. If I work hard and create possessions, create wealth, I have a right to it. Um, life, and I have a right to freedom. Nobody can interfere with my freedom, okay? Um, let's see. All right. So removing anything from the state of nature in order to give it value creates ownership. That's how you are a legitimate owner of the land. So in the US, people, people the way the US got populated is it was the frontier. People would go out into the frontier where only the Native Americans and the Native Americans had no right to the land because they didn't give it value. They didn't cut down the trees and plant corn or plant food, you know, they, and that means they had no right to it. And so when the Europeans came and pushed them off the land, that was God's will. That's what rational, hardworking people do. And the Native Americans are lazy and ignorant. And so we can convert them to Christianity and make them into good profit maximizers. <laughs> but, you know, we don't have to apologize for pushing them. And then if they fight back, we can massacre them. That's all part of God's plan. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, but we're not supposed to hoard things. Um, all right. People are supposed to work for their wealth. Uh, um, John Locke did not like the fact that we did create money because then people could get rich without having to work. And because then you, you weren't as wealthy, your wealth wasn't related to exactly how hard you worked. And that was, he knew that that was not a good thing. Um, Okay, this is how money came into use and he's unhappy about money, but all right. So let me do this outline and it should take me about 10 minutes and then I'll put you into groups. So again, think of something 
some one point or two point that you want to bring up that isn't a question, like what the heck was that about? Just something that, wow, when she said that, I thought about that, right? I thought about American companies in my country, or I thought about the way my ruler talks, or I thought about um, the way my parents, I mean, anything from your own experience that you can understand that this has had, has had an impact, that's all. Um, all right, because you all have different opinions, so it'll be interesting, I hope. All right, so all human beings are by nature blank slates, and we have sensations, and we are molded. Our, everything about us is a function of our interaction with the outside world, natural and cultural, okay? That's determinism. He was a determinist. Um, that means everybody is free and equal. Everybody's a blank slate. You have the right to life, liberty, health, and possessions. If somebody hurts you, you have a right to fight back. You have a right to, viol to punish people who violate your rights. Um, and you have a right to punish according to what's appropriate. The trouble is most people are not good judges of that. They overreact. And so that's why we need a common set of laws. But everyone has a right to their body, a right to what he removes from nature. If you're industrious and rational and you give it value, you have a right to it. Um, you have a right to punish wrongdoers. People do not judge well in their own case. Therefore, the state of nature leads to war, right? People overreact and then they overreact. So if you are rational and you want a stable society where you can work up the land and, and prosper, you will give over that one right, the right to punish people to a standing body of laws, okay? And the purpose of those laws is to protect individuals' rights, okay? How you do that, you elect officials, you create the laws, you apply the laws, and then you execute the laws, right? So the judge says three years in prison, then the, you know, the prisoner, the people who run the prisons take care of them after that. The citizens have to consent, right? But the rulers have to be elected. If you enjoy the benefits of society, if the society protects you from people who would harm you, then you, as long as you benefit from it, you must consent to live by the rule of law. If you're rational, you, you agree to give up the right to punish. Um, the most important function is the creation of laws. Everyone is equal under the laws. They're made for the good of everyone, not the rulers. Uh, people, um, you can't tax people without consent. So if you vote for a leader who votes for taxes, basically you've consented to taxation. Um, when the rulers use their power to help their friends and enemies, and harm their enemies, then you have a right to rebel. So that was a big deal um, at the time. It justified the US, uh, the Revolutionary War in the US. And that's, I don't know how much of a big deal that is in your countries. It was a big deal at the time. Okay, Locke thought you couldn't have any atheists because they wouldn't be trusted to tell the truth. I tell you, it's only very recently in the US that atheists have been allowed to be jurors or to, you know, to participate completely in the legal system, which is really, really a horrible prejudice against atheists. Um, but Locke thought that people are by nature wicked enough that they have to have the fear of God and the fear of eternal damnation to prevent them from lying in court. All right, what about marriage? 
Okay, in the eyes of God, you might think that every marriage is ordained by God and you should never get divorced. Fine, that's a matter of faith. In the eyes of the judge and the laws, marriage is two free equal adults that have consented to get married, which means they give over their right to their body to the other person, right? It, there's a, a level of intimacy amidst married partners that nobody you've never consented to with anyone else, right? Um, and then if, if you decide to get divorced, someone could say you're going to go to hell, that's fine. But the judge isn't going to tell you that. He's just going to say, if both of you want this, and your kids are raised and they're economically self-sufficient, it's not our job to force you. You are right. You have a right to freedom. And if that's how you want to use your freedom, okay, we're not going to get in your way. Um, it's rational to have children. Um, the husband and wife have equal rights. This was very radical. It used to be that the husband had all the rights. Um, the husband works outside the home, so he has the right to the fruit of his labor, and the wife does not have any right to the family's wealth. Instead, the wife works raising the kids, so if there's a divorce, the kids should take care of her. Um, it's rational to support your children the goal of parenting is to support them so they eventually become economically self-supporting. Then they have to agree to consent to the laws because they enjoy the stability provided by the laws. Uh, society is the free association of free and equal adults. The associations are by choice and consent, not by force. And here's the problem. Do people have a right? Do citizens have a right to, to education? Not according to Locke. Do they have a right to health care? Not according to Locke. Housing? No. The only thing they have a right to is to life, liberty, health, and possessions. They have a right to sign business contracts so that they can be prosperous, but there's no right. So Originally, there's no minimum wage. There's no health and safety protection laws. There's no child labor laws. There's no women's labor. I mean, the workers lived under horrible conditions, but it was because minimal government. You, you signed the contract. And as long as you sign the contract, you have to do the job however the owner defines it. So money did stick to money. Money was invented and this inequalities began to emerge. Um, everything is about cost benefit calculation. Um, if people are rational, the government does not need to intervene. Well, what happens if they're not rational? What are you going to do? Okay. In relationship to other countries, uh, people have a right to have the government protect them. So on John Locke's view, the only purpose of government is the military and the police to maintain your security. And I know Americans who think this. Okay. What's the problem with it? Um, the, the economic system. Adam Smith, in the original state of things, everybody had you know, equal access. And if a, somebody created corn, planted corn, they could trade it and get the, the value of the labor they put into it. But the trouble is, once you have a more complex system, if you're a farmer and you're renting, from you can't pay for your housing. So you have to rent from someone who owns the housing. And you have to, he, he, he lends you money until the harvest comes in and you can pay, but he lends it at an interest. He demands a profit because his, his housing isn't 
making money while you're waiting for the crops to come in. So the government doesn't make any laws to protect the workers, all right? If the, at what actually happened, the first set of laws that came in were labor unions so that the workers could strike. But if they did, the owners could just wait and starve them out. So the owners developed all the power over the workers. So unequal wealth leads to unequal rights. So the workers did not have a right to defend themselves in court because they couldn't pay for a good lawyer. They, they didn't have a right to start a magazine so that no one was informed about their point of view. They didn't have um, any, uh, any, they couldn't pay for political campaigns to, to have legislators elected that would protect their rights. So the legislators were all, the laws being made were protecting the rights of the rich. Okay, and there was no right to education. So now when the jobs that are imp, uh, worth getting that are middle-class jobs require education, but on Locke's view, there's no right. So rich people will get good education, poor people will get nothing. Right to health care. Poor people do not make enough money to buy their own health care on the market. But according to Locke, they have no right. The government has no obligation. The government is morally obliged not to give you health care because that's violating the, it's stealing money from the rich. It's stealing your money, your hard earned money. Um, so, the rich have a right to keep their wealth. Taxes are a kind of, of uh, theft. Like whenever the government taxes you, except for military and police. Um, all right, so US citizens disagree on all this. And that's why we disagree because this rights language and this minimal government language has led to this huge gap. Plus for the purposes of this class, environmental protection, right? There's no right uh, for the government to prevent you from polluting. And on the other, and it's even immoral, it's immoral for the government to tax you to have anti-air pollution laws or anti-water pollution, or to ask you to put, to change the way you build your factory. That's government intervention in my life. That's why Americans, even though they had all the scientists, considered COVID a hoax. They would not wear their masks. They would not social distance because they felt that they have a right to liberty, right? And they have a right to decide what they want to do. And if they didn't think they were going to lose their health, but the argument against the argument for masks and um, social distancing is public health that you care about somebody else, right? And and many Americans are not raised to care about anybody but themselves, and it's a moral obligation because that's what will motivate you to be rational and calculate your own self-interest, economic self-interest. If you have the government come in, you'll be lazy. People believe this. I don't know if you believe it, but Americans really believe it. It's a very powerful mindset and it's leading to <laughs> destruction. So I do want you to get into groups now and I will put I'll put this outline on the part of it, right? Well, I don't know which part to put on. Maybe this part, and uh, maybe, and um, the point is that how has this doctrine of rights prevented us from environmental destruction? Or, I mean, if you wanna talk about his idea about marriage, that you have a right to get divorced, but the woman has no right to property. If you want to talk about these other issues, 
as long as you keep talking about how they're related and how they're, for the purposes of this class, they're related to environmental protection. Um, so I will put you into breakout rooms. I will pause the report. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yep. So, uh, we are from group one, so we have discussed about the government's law since uh, America and most of the country, they are thinking about the economical power. That's why they think about only their rights. They are not thinking about the other country's consequences and what they are going through. Um, so, even it's all about the power right and economy that's this is the most this is the main part of our discussion that we thought even so they when they are thinking of the power they are also thinking about the making money so when they thinking like this they are not thinking about the climate justice so all that's why the even even if you see the most of the developing countries they are the most sufferer in this case but when it comes to America, they are not the most, I mean, they are not in the most suffering countries like this. So that's what we thought. Okay, good. Group, group number two. Anybody gonna step up? All right, so next time you have to, you know, assign a leader, someone's going to report back. Uh, group number three. Yes, Professor. Uh, hello. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, Professor, uh, actually, we wasted a lot of time because, like, there, uh, the screen was not showing, so some of us forgot the point. So we reshared again and we picked the point like uh, from the locks model and there there was like the marriage thing um uh, the husband works outside the home and has right to fruits of his labor and work uh, wife will work inside the home only so we didn't think that uh, that should be a law because uh, because of this kind of laws uh, in our developing countries developing countries like such as bangladesh uh, there are a lots of lots of families they believe actually work should wife should work inside the home only and and this is literally oppressing the women rights and they are also being very weak uh, according to like they they think like husband are the uh, their husbands are the main of their house and whatever they will tell and uh, women will believe the same thing and they will not they will not argue about it but that that's a changing in the basis of today's um, today's world like this is actually changing now because a lot of women are uh, standing for their rights but this has been uh, like a tradition in our countries like women will all only be working inside the household and this kind of thing so this this is really wrong yeah okay so you do have to be you have to think about when you use the word rights what the heck do you mean right because yeah you can talk about women's rights but legally in our system there was no such thing right originally they they couldn't even vote so um it is important to know that what might seem obvious to you that women have equal rights the reason why they have such difficulty is that that has not been the background and so you know women have a lot of difficulty getting access to the legal system, getting respect from the laws for the same reasons that nature has, because that original language had a certain worldview attached to it. And that worldview just will not change. So that again, when corporations come in to developing countries, they don't say we're just evil and we're gonna exploit you. They say we are hardworking, industrious, we know how to create value. We're gonna you know, come in and be the good guys, right? 
we're God's messengers. We're, you know, superior. So I do think that you need to remember that. Okay, Shazneen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Um, Professor, I think with big corporations, like uh, even Nestle, for example, I think they're responsible for creating a lot of waste that end up on landfills. But then they also like, they try to um, cover it up. Like uh, they try to do something else for the environment to make people forget about what uh, about the damage that they actually cause. Yep. You have to be really careful about these things. <laughs> what people say and what they do or what they say based on an old worldview that justify anyway. It's um, and Professor, I think uh, I've seen some pictures like um, where companies say that they use biodegradable packaging, but then on the outside it's biodegradable, but on the inside it's like a, like a plastic film. So in the end, it's not really biodegradable. So I think yeah. consumers have to be really careful. That's just plain old rhetoric. Um, I'll tell you, I'm really old. And at Nestle, there was a, a boycott of Nestle because they were selling formula to women and telling them not to breastfeed, telling them formula was better. And then they mixed it with polluted water and their kids were dying. And, you know, it was really unconscionable. So Nestle, in my mind, Nestle's, got a long way to go to become respectable. And it sounds like they're not headed in the right direction. Um, okay, where were we? Book uh, group three, did you report? Yes, professor. Group four? Group five? Hi, Dr. Beck. So for group five, um, Tasmin, she just joined it today. And so she doesn't really know what's going on. So I did share with her a bit about my view on Locke's perspective of um, his advocacy towards freedom and equality with police government intervention. Um, for me personally, I just wish that Cambodia is anywhere near what Locke was advocating for, because in Cambodia, freedom of rights and government's little intervention is only written on paper, but it's not happening in reality. Um, here, if people were even to voice their concerns related to go the government, they would be either silenced or put to jail and no one will ever question the government's action. And so I just want Cambodia to at least come anywhere near what Locke is advocating for so that people are able to utilize that written freedom um, in reality and not let the government, the greedy government officials just do whatever they wish and not let the citizens have their rights. Right, so that would be the freedom of speech to speak out about corruption, right? Yes. Journalism, free journalism. And um, also, um, yeah, the, the idea, the US, Locke had this idea that when the leaders are corrupt, actually the people have the right and the moral obligation to, per, to have a re revolution. <laughs> that was totally new, right? People have a right to destroy, to change their government. Yeah, that was, that was extreme. Um, so I do have to tell you that there's a guy from Bangladesh who taught economics at my old school. He came from Bangladesh and he got into economics because he liked the free market idea because his government was so corrupt and powerful, right? But then as time went on, he looked at America and he said, now, wait a second. In America, the corporations are powerful and the government is weak, you know, and the corporations are controlling the whole political process. Whereas in Bangladesh, the government was controlling the economic process. Does that make sense to a lot of you? I'm just curious. Um, 
if if you understand that what's actually going on versus the language and so so he, he originally idealized the free market and then after a while he realized that that can that can go bad um but yeah the freedom i mean you know americans are always questioning their leaders but it's not always very informed that's for sure but they do have a right to speak out that's true um okay so uh one more reminder which is if you come prepared or if you make sure to pay attention to the lecture and have something to say in the discussion group your post will be much better right so now you have to go back and you have to post on bacon and lock on that class and that will be due the day after tomorrow. So you really have to get that due because it's a whole week after we did it and you can't get too far behind, okay? So now the next half of the class is gonna be on the, the next mindset. So in the syllabus, it'll have, what'll have be listed is the new one that we introduced, the second hour and a half of class. So, this is Kant's view is another way of understanding what modern science is, what and how we should think. Now that we have modern science and industry and all that good stuff. So Bacon thought science is facts, the bees collecting the pollen and making honey, right? You collect data and you make knowledge. The knowledge is about patterns that you've recognized in the data. All right. Now, Locke had this theory of rights. That's not empirical. That's not based on facts. That's ideas that if you look at a baby, babies are all the same. So they're equal and they're free. And so he starts from that and he creates a set of concepts that he wants to guide human behavior, not to describe human behavior, but to, for people to use and to motivate them to create a whole new kind of history, right? All right, now Immanuel Kant took Newtonian science so you, Newtonian science is a system of scientific laws. I don't know if, how many of you took physics, but, and I don't know how many of you learned quantum physics as opposed to Newtonian physics. Uh, I didn't take physics, which is terrible. I should have taken it in high school. Nobody made me do anything. It was the sixties, so fine. Um, but you have the law of gravity you have the law of attraction, you have uh, whatever um, wh whatever moves, continues to move until friction is applied to it. So it's a whole body of scientific laws that all fit into a system. And so Immanuel Kant was a mathematician, but he taught Newtonian physics for 20 years. And then, he read a book by David Hume. So Kant preached this doctrine of the scientific laws are necessarily true. They're absolutely true. They're universally true. They're objectively true, right? The law of gravity, necessary, whatever, okay. And Bacon came along and he said, Look, science is about facts. Facts aren't, you know, facts are not necessarily true. Facts are not universally true. So, you know, there's nothing in this pen that would make, that has any characteristic of necessity, right? The pen is made out of material, it's contingent, it's not, it didn't necessarily come into existence. It's not gonna exist forever. 
it's what the pen looks like to me is different than what it looks like to you. So science is supposed to be about material things and they're not necessarily true or objectively true or uh, they're not linked to a system of laws. So how do you get from the data to all these, you know, concepts of reason? Um, okay. And so I'm going to show you, let's see, share the screen. So we're going to talk more about Kant here. Um, what was his big insight? All right. Now, during the Enlightenment, the way they thought of themselves is they are going to absolutely radically change human nature, change human history, change the human condition for good, okay? It's never going to be like it used to be, all right? So um, John Locke, the blank slate, giving people human rights, teaching them how to behave politically, te uh, teaching them all these different behaviors right? It's you, your participation in public life is totally different. Your treatment of the land is totally different. Your understanding of marriage is totally different. Everything is different. All right, so Kant, same thing. Um, and he even compared what he did to, he said, just like uh, Copernicus, everybody thought the earth was at the center of the universe and the sun went around it. But Copernicus said, no, the sun is at the center and the earth goes around it. So it was a complete shift. And Kant said, before Newtonian physics, we thought that our minds are always, what we claim to know is about the world, right? We never even questioned that. But since Newtonian physics, we can realize that the science is about our minds. It's about the structure of our minds and the way we think. It's about human reason. All right. So you get, once again, you get that word reason. It means something entirely different, entirely different. I wish I could have a different word, but I can't. So there's Aristotle's mind, there's Locke's calculating the most efficient means to your economic prosperity, and then there's Kant. Kant's view of reason is that there's a structure in the brain before we have any experience of life. It's not reacting to life. It isn't formed by our external experience. Rather, it's the filter through which we, we look at and experience the world. So what Kant says is that, um, let me see, let me go to this one. Um, so he just said Hume, uh, Hume technically says, we don't really know if the sun will rise tomorrow because the universe is material and contingent. I mean, it's very likely. That's why you have probabilities now instead of these absolute certainties. Um, so Kant, though, wanted to show that scientific is, scientific knowledge is necessarily true. Um, so he argues that our human reason is something we're born with, and we use it to understand our experience. Let's see. Um, so, let, I mean, so you got to go through this experiment because, again, this has a profound effect on the way we treat the natural world. So this class is about environmental ethics, but I hope you understand that Locke's view of rights has this profound effect 
on environmental ethics and on our inability to deal with climate change. Okay, Kant's view, the same. It has a profound effect on the way we, we behave, the way we educate our people, the way we apply our education, and it undermines um, our ability to address climate change, okay? Um, so what Kant says is that we think in terms of necessity, uh, things are necessarily true. Um, one thing causes the other thing. The notion of causality is a concept of reason. So David Hume says, where do you get cause? All you get is you see one thing and you see another thing. You see it, you see it, you see it, you see it. And so Hume says those are the, the rules of association. You associate one thing to another, but that's not causality. Causality is a, a concept of reason. And Kant says, yeah, it is. And we impose it on the world. So we impose all these concepts and we do it because our minds insist on making sense out of our experience. And so Kant distinguishes between the phenomenon, which is the way human beings, rational beings experience the world and what's actually out there. So I don't, I hope as a kid, especially you might have done a thought experiment. What would happen if you had a sixth sense, right? Make up a sixth sense. Or what would happen if you actually could feel all the atoms moving around, right? The motions, uh, you'd, you'd go nuts. But there's a lot out there. We have a rational being is going to recognize that there's a lot out there, or it's more reasonable to think there's a lot of stuff out there that we don't know about because we can't digest it and create this wonderful body of scientific laws. So the first filters between us and the world is space and time. And he says space and time are in our heads. And Newtonian physics starts out with the concepts of absolute space and absolute time. And so Kant says those are categories of reason so that we, we um, force everything to become into this um, sieve of phenomena. So whatever it is we can see within a concept of absolute space and time is a phenomenon. And then we can make sense of that phenomenon. Um, okay, and so he divides reality into two parts, the things as they are and the things as we experience them. So by dividing reality into two, Kant says we don't, we can say that we don't have necessary, we can say, sorry, we do have necessary knowledge of the phenomenon because we've imposed these categories and created this concept of necessity. And this is where he makes the analogy with instead of thinking that our minds are responding to the world, we, uh, we think our minds control what we experience of the world. So the source of reality is in our heads, not out there in the world. Um, okay, so the nature of scientific laws, they're universally true, they're necessarily true, they're internally consistent, they're objectively true, they're a set of cause-effect relationships, they follow the laws of logic, and they're constructed by human reason, all right? And he says, I limited reason, right? in order to save science, right? So science is legitimate as long as you say it's about the phenomenon, all right? 
then his relationship between reason and faith, okay? So on this view, is it more reasonable? He's saying it's more reasonable to believe in God, okay? Because reason cannot answer the question, why is there anything? What do the laws of reason apply to and what do they not apply to? What's the relationship between phenomena and noumena? What's the noumena? Does the human soul exist? Is the soul immortal? Does free will exist? We can't answer that. Reason absolutely can't make sense of any of that. But it's more reasonable for a reason to conclude that there is a God who created the universe than it is to deny that such a thing exists because nothing we study created itself, right? It needed a cause. So why is there anything? Well, it's reasonable to believe there's a God that created it. Um, our reason wants to know the cause and can't answer it because all we can study is the phenomenon. But we, our reason teaches us that it's, that we ought to think there's a noumena, right? There's a God, there's something outside of our experience. Plus, it's more reasonable to believe that a part of our soul is a noumena, right? And is free and immortal than it is to believe that, it, that that's not true. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. Um, he just thinks, just because we can think of ourselves as a phenomena, but we should also be able to think of our souls as a noumena, just like we think of the natural world. Now we know that we filter it. All we know is the phenomena, but it's reasonable to think there's more to it than that. Now, how else do we argue for a noumena? Okay. Our ethics, right? Okay, when reason turns toward the natural world, it creates a body of laws. All right, now, if human beings are phenomena only, okay, those body of scientific laws are necessarily true. And if humans are just phenomena, then our behavior would be determined, right? Just like, right? When he says, when I drop the pen, it's going to fall necessarily because the phenomenon follows the law of gravity and the law of gravity is necessarily true, and objectively true, right? So if all we, all human beings are is phenomena, then our behavior occurs necessarily, right? And so there's no free will there's no moral responsibility, but it's more reasonable to think that we're both phenomena and noumena, and, um, and it's more reasonable because of our consciousness, okay? Now, how does our consciousness work? First of all, we're aware of ourselves as physical beings, as phenomena, right? I have brown hair, I have, you know, these physical characteristics that I have. I'm five feet five, whatever. That's myself as a phenomenon, right? But, and I'm conscious of myself as having emotions that are connected to my body, right? I get hungry, I get thirsty, um, something happens and I get angry. Um, something happens and I get excited, okay. All those emotions come from our relationship with the phenomenal world and our self as a phenomenal being. And that's what he calls inclinations. Okay, we have all these inclinations, these reactions, but we're also conscious of ourselves as having pure reason, the ability to create this body of laws to understand the natural world, but we also, when we're deciding what to do, 
we can say, well, um, I could, um, I could go to the grocery store right now, but I ought not to do it because it's class time, right? So what we're conscious of ourselves is that we have options, right? And then we tell ourselves, you ought to do this. This is the right thing to do, okay? And so that ability to distinguish between what I want to do, my inclination, and what reason tells me I ought to do. I mean, the fact that we have that kind of conflict indicates that we have choice and, it, and if we can actually act on either the inclination or the moral ought, this duty telling ourselves you have a duty, you ought to do that. If we can actually act on either one of those, it means that we have a will, right? We have this power of the will because that's the power that enables us not to react and act on inclination only. So we have reason and we can act on our reason, which means we must have this power of the will and we must have a free will, which means the will is free from inclinations. So we never have to act on the basis of pleasures and pains. We never have to act on the basis of that we can always act on the basis of reason and what reason tells us we ought to do. Um, let's see, since we, okay, okay. Since we know we can act on either one, then it's reasonable to think we have a noumena over and above our phenomena, right? That we have a free will and it's reasonable to think that our souls are immortal and we get judged on the basis of acting on reason, right? Okay, our phenomenal self is not free. I can't decide I'm gonna defy the law of gravity, right? I'm not free to do that. Our bodies are subject to the absolute laws of science, but our reason is not, it's free. So it's reasonable to think that the laws of science only apply to phenomena, but the free will is connected to the noumena, right? And it can act on the basis of reason. Um, if you have a good will, then you always follow reason, which means abiding by the moral law, all right? And the goodwill is more important than natural intelligence or wealth or anything else a person can have. Because if you have natural intelligence, but you're motivated by inclinations and all you want is wealth or pleasure or power, then your intelligence is worthless. It's going to make you evil. Um, any other gift that you have, if you don't have a good will, you won't use it uh, according to reason. You won't act rationally. Um, but the good will determines how your gifts will be used, meaning they will be used according to the moral law that reason gives you. Um, let's see. And the good will shines even when no one knows. So sometimes you could be looking at someone behaving a certain way and you don't know what's motivating them, why? So someone might, um, oh, someone might be in a Black Lives Matter demonstration, but they're in it because their boyfriend is in it and they want to get his attention or his approval, right? That's not, that's not the right reason. Uh, or you're in Black Lives Matter because you got paid to be there. No, um, if you're there because you think it's an absolute, um, according to Kant, you would think every human being has to be treated as an end in themselves. And black people have always been treated as means 
to white people's goals. They've always been treated as things and that's wrong. So that would be the Kantian reason to be in a Black Lives Matter is that Black people have been treated as things and they need to be treated as rational beings of infinite worth. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, it's just that you, you don't know what people are actually doing unless you know why they're doing it. Um, but a good will, having a good will, acting on the basis of the moral law is the ultimate value. Um, you shouldn't consider good or evil on the basis of its consequences, right? So you can't judge whether the Black Lives Matter movement is good or bad just because of whether it had good consequences. It's the principle of it that's good. Um, let's see, it's reasonable for us to think we have a free will and that we create a body of moral laws that are universally applicable, okay? So just like we create a body of scientific laws, we create a body of moral laws. Um, but those will never be necessarily true or objectively true because people can always choose, right? You might say, you know, I really ought to treat my sister as an end in herself and not just as a means to my own power or something. But that doesn't mean you'll actually do it. <laughs> You know, you can formulate a moral law, but you always have free choice. So those, those laws are not necessarily true. Um, let's see, that's why they're always framed as what you ought to do. They never are framed as you will do this because human behavior is not necessary. It's not predictable because we have free will. Um, All right, when people make the right choices, they act from a good will, okay? Um, all right, so the good will is of infinite worth of everything in the whole universe, everything else, and this is where we get to environmental ethics, okay guys, here's where you have to pay attention. Um, animals are not ends in themselves, they are not of infinite worth. The natural world is not an end in itself. It's not of infinite worth. So it's all right, according to God, because God gave us reason, right? Reason is that capacity that makes us in the image of God. This is our highest capacity. This is what gives human beings infinite worth and everything else a means to humanity, okay? But we should always treat other rational beings as an end in themselves. We should never treat them as a means only, okay? So for example, the woman at the grocery store who's checking out my groceries, I should never treat him as just a means, right? Would you get this done? Would you hurry up? I gotta get out of here right? You always have to treat them as having dignity and infinite worth as a rational being. And then also it's okay if they help you check out of the grocery store, but that's not all they are. What they really are is this creature with infinite worth. Um, so he was a pacifist, right? because wars always involve treating people as means to your end, right? You're never treating them as ends in themselves. You're asking them to die for the sake of some project that you have, some consequence. And so he was obviously against war and he wrote a book called Perpetual Peace. Um, sometimes, all right, here's the next step. Reason would say that people who act on a good will are of infinite worth and they should not suffer unjustly, right? Reason says that. 
if you use your goodwill, you should never suffer unjustly. Well, that is not the case, right? That is not the way the world works. On the other hand, people who are motivated by inclination should not be rewarded. The trouble is they often are. So life on earth does not follow what reason considers absolutely reasonable, right? Life on earth really violates our rational, our way of thinking, the way reason thinks. So um, naturally, rationally, we would think good people need to be rewarded and bad people need to be punished, right? Since it's rational to want this cause effect connection between goodness and happiness and evil and unhappiness, but this doesn't happen on earth, it's reasonable to think the soul is immortal at that eventually people get their just rewards and punishments. That reason just demands that, right? And so reason believes that after death, everything is resolved. And um, it's reasonable to think that that's true. Um, so this is what Kant believes. By distinguishing between phenomena and noumena, he's preserved the validity of the scientific laws. He's established the reasonableness of belief in God. He's preserved the belief in free will in spite of natural determinism. He's preserved the belief in immortality. Um, and all of his positions start out with our experience of what of our consciousness of ourselves as reasonable beings in a phenomenal world. So he's limited the scope of reason and, and preserved morality, God, um, and free will and eternal reward and punishment. So for in his mind, you know, these were beliefs that the Catholic church and that the church promoted, but he's saying, no, it's not for those reasons. We have a new view of reason and a new view of science, but we can still end up with the same conclusion that it's reasonable to think the soul's immortal but for entirely different reasons. And also now we have a much better guide for how to live and how to move civilization forward. We need to use our reason um, and develop a culture based on reason. Okay, now let me go to his method of teaching. All right, again, I'm not gonna take questions at the moment because I know this is complicated, but let's take a five minute break, all right? Um, so my clock has 11.05. So why don't you take a break? Cause I know this is mentally um, not what you sit around and talk about day in and day out. But just before we break, Remember, the punchline of this is that it's okay to treat the natural world as a means and not an end. And the only end of infinite worth is human reason. <laughs> Just keep that in mind, okay? <laughs> that's where we're going. And that's, that's what should horrify you by the time I get through the first five lectures. Every single view, no matter how much they disagree, they all end up with destroying life on earth. And we have so many people with these mindsets that it's really scary. <laughs> anyway, take a break, five minutes, you know, just to cheer you up before I give you five minutes off. All right, take, uh, I'll see you in five minutes, okay?
Okay. Now, <clears throat> at the end of the class, I'm going to take attendance. So please do not leave. I will take it before, you know, the official 10 minutes after the hour. But I have my, I have the class roster. So then I will, you know, just show you the names. I'll read them off. And if anybody is here that's not on the roster, you should let me know. Um, all right. So the next step. <clears throat> so far, Kant has established that we have this capacity that came from nowhere. It was not the result of evolution. It's not connected to the world. It's the filter that we got structured into our heads before we were born, and it controls how we actually experience the world. And it does that because the power of our reason does not allow us to take in anything that it can't make sense out of. All right, so it does make sense out of the world. Newtonian science is its way of making sense. But we also have this capacity, we can direct it toward our behavior and we can decide, am I going to live on the basis of the moral law or am I going to live on the basis of my inclinations, my desires? I know when I have a drive, I'm hungry or thirsty and I know that that isn't the source of that impulse is not reason, <laughs> right? But reason can tell me you ought to eat, you ought not to eat, whatever. But always, no matter what else reason tells you in a specific situation, you always have to treat rational nature as an end in itself. Because you have to have a sense of your own infinite worth and dignity as a rational being. So, um, this is what distinguishes us from the animals and the rest of the natural world. Reason is not natural. It's not naturally connected to nature. It is driven to understand nature in a way that makes sense to itself. <laughs> and it leaves out, says there's a lot out there I don't understand. This is what I understand. Okay, so... How do you teach children to act on the basis of reason? Well, right from when they're little, you should, uh, you know, so a kid comes in from playing, Johnny hit me, you know, I hit him back. It's like, nope, nope, sit down. Okay, that's your inclination to hit him back. Nope, you're not just a physical creature. You are a rational being and you should treat yourself with dignity. So you have to sit down and you have to think, what is the rational way to treat Johnny, right? Your reason is your source of your dignity. Johnny has that capacity. He's not using it, but that's his problem. <laughs> You always act on the basis of reason and you always treat other rational beings with respect, with infinite respect because they have that capacity. And that's it. I don't wanna hear any more about it. You know, buddy, forget it. We're not thinking about context. We're not thinking about consequences. We're thinking about absolute principles. The principle is always act on reason, always treat other people as rational beings, okay? This has nothing to do with sensation. Um, develop the habit of judging actions according to whether they're motivated by a moral law. You sharpen these judgments, you get it into a habit. Um, 
Let's see. So uh, an action might conform to a, a moral law, but not be motivated. Okay, by that. Again, it's like the Black Lives Matter, right? It conforms to the moral law of treat people as an end, but it's not motivated by that. It's motivated by wanting to be with your boyfriend. Okay. Um, so reason starts to take pleasure, take satisfaction in following its concepts, right? So the one pleasure you get in life is the pleasure of knowing you followed the moral law. Um, then you become, whoops, you become more and more conscious of your freedom. In other words, you can detach yourself from what goes on around the world and just act on principle. So you're conscious that you're free, you're liberated from all those irrational desires and reactions and all that stuff and distractions. So you, you have a sense of reverence for your freedom. Like I respect the fact that I can act on reason and nothing else. Um, all right, let's see. Moral character is based on concepts and principles, not emotions and moods. All right. Okay, then he has some examples. So I will go and look at these examples just to give you an idea of how using pure logic, right? This is a mathematician. He's using pure logic to make a decision about committing suicide, right? It seems like your reason for committing it would be probably pretty emotional, right? And he goes, forget it, no matter how depressed you are, no matter how the consequences, no matter, forget all the contexts. You have to say, um, what can I will to be a universal law? What does reason require? All right, nothing that loves itself kills itself. All rational creatures love life and they desire the improvement of their lives. All rational creatures are of infinite worth and they should know that they are of infinite worth and no rational creature would destroy a creature of infinite worth. Therefore, no rational creature will kill itself. It's completely irrational, right? It's contradicting itself. That's why reason forbids it, okay? Whether or not to tell a lie, right? You tell somebody you can pay back the money when you know you can't pay it back. Well, why do you do that? Well, the, the consequences, like I need the money. All right, but that's all based in the world of inclination and the world of uh, phenomena the world of money and power and all that stuff, right? But can I will it to be a universal law? All right, so what is language? Language is a set of universals, okay? Everyone, people communicate what's in their minds through language. So if language is a tool of reason, it's invented by reason, it's reason's description of its own reasoning. So you would never take that language, that tool of reason and deliberately use it to violate reason, right? That's a contradiction that's unthinkable. That's like a math problem that you say P equals not P, <laughs> okay? It's just unthinkable. So what can I will to be a universal law? No false promise is intended to be kept. All promises by definition, if it's a promise, it's intended to be kept. So no false promises are real promises. No false promises are communication through language. All rational creatures communicate through language. Therefore, they, rational creatures never make false promises promises, right? No matter what the, con the context. No rational creature abuses language. False promises are an abuse of language. No rational creature makes false promises, okay? 
whether or not to cultivate a talent. Am I hurting any well? Well, what can I will to be a universal law? No one who's idle wills that their faculties um, be developed, right? But all rational creatures will that their capacities be developed because rational creatures know they're of infinite worth. So they must will that they would live the full life. So no rational creature will be idle. It violates the definition of a rational creature. It contradicts a principle of our nature. Whether to be generous, right? What can I will to be a universal law? All rational creatures by definition need the love and sympathy of others. Prosperous and stingy people are rational. They need the love and sympathy of others. If they need the love and sympathy, um, okay, they should be generous. They ought to be generous because they need the love and sympathy of people. So again, on principle, you should give money away if you have it. So he's using mathematical kinds of reasoning. Um, he's getting a set of definitions. His, his ethic is basically deductive. You have a set of different definitions. Here's what it means to be a rational creature. Rational creatures have infinite worth. If they do that, then this follows, then this follows. So that's deductive rather than inductive. It has, you're not reacting to what's outside of you. You're deducting from definitions and then you're coming to a conclusion and acting. Um, all right, so why is this important for environmental ethics? That's, that's the key, right? Well, because now nature is a tool for human beings. Um, so I did, um, okay. So here's the argument. Let me just show you. I have a two page or one page uh, excerpt where you can read the original text. You just read it to get this idea of how Kant was thinking, what he was thinking, how he was thinking. Um, I'm not going to give you a test on this, but I did. I do feel like I need to give you some original documents so you can expand your mind. I mean, you can really get a sense of these very influential minds and how they thought. Um, but here's the outline, right? Humanity is an end in itself and rational beings alone have moral worth. Nothing else in the universe has moral worth. Nothing else is capable of a good will. Nothing else can act on reason alone. Okay, um, everything else in the, in the world, the natural world, the animals are just acting on inclination and they're not of infinite worth, okay? Um, and then he disagrees and we will talk about the utilitarians in an, I, maybe the next class, I think. So they think that pleasure and pain is the only thing that motivates people. And so these two camps during the enlightenment, Locke, Kant, and utilitarians, they completely disagreed with each other about how we should educate people and how we should develop a culture, an entirely new culture from the one in the past, but they completely disagreed about what the heck we're supposed to be doing. Um, all right, let's see. Act to treat humanity, whether in your own person or any other, as an end. Animals do not possess the faculty of reason. They don't have the activity of will. They cannot act on the basis of the moral law. So we do not have a direct duty to treat animals as ends. 
we ought to act in humane ways toward them because, quote, a person's act is inhumane and damages in himself that humanity with, uh, with it is his duty to show towards humankind. Okay, when people mistreat animals, it, it corrupts their own capacity to treat other human beings well. So treating animals well is practice for, for what's really important, which is treating human beings well. It affects our dealings with humans. If a man shoots a dog because the animal is no longer capable of service, he doesn't fail in his duty to the dog. He doesn't have a duty to his dog, but it's inhuman and it damages his own humanity, which he needs to show toward humankind. Um, let's see, so he needs to basically train his feelings so that he doesn't have that feeling to kill something that's not of service to him because that's not good practice for valuing a person as an end in itself. Um, okay, now what about this? Here's the things to debate. What if cruelty to animals, right? What if it's a result of experiments that promote human well being, right? Well, Kant would say it's justified, right? Cruelty for sport is not justified because that's just based on pure inclination, the pleasure of killing an animal. And that's not good practice because you're treating an animal merely as a means to the point where you're killing. Um, unless, of course, they're, you're preventing them from overbreeding and starving, something like that. But not hunting for sport, not, you know, using a machine gun uh, rather than just something where you're developing a skill. Um, I actually had a student. Um, all right. So I had a student who loved animals and we were, she missed class because of a lab. And so I was telling her that we're talking about animal rights. And I, I said, we were talking about, what about if you have research for cancer, right? To, to, to cure cancer in human beings, or you torture rabbits in order to have mascara last longer. Okay, and, and there are, I don't know if they do it anymore, but they used to do that with rabbits. They used to torture them, sort of keep their eyes open and put the mascara on or something and just see how long it would last. I don't, I don't know specifically, but it was okay to torture rabbits. It didn't really matter if it was mascara or cancer, right? And so I asked her, you know, what do you think? Is there some kind of a scale, like the degree of the torture or the nature of the research uh, and whether how important it is for human well-being and all that stuff? And she just looked at me and she said, well, there's always prisoners. Okay. And so, and she said, well, they've given up all their rights. Okay. So she thinks that prisoners have no rights, right? Now Kant would not think that, right? Prisoners are of infinite worth. He would definitely think prisoners should be treated with dignity and respect because they are rational creatures. Even if they didn't always act rationally, right? They're of they acted on inclination. They need to be locked up so they don't hurt somebody else. But they always have to be treated as ends, never as means only, right? So anyway, that's why we get, that's where the relationship to animals. Animals have no rights and they have no uh, infinite worth, but you, you shouldn't harm them unnecessarily because it hurts you. Now, this is an outline from an argument that defends Kant. Um, 
Kant's view of how we treat animals, which is fine. You can look at that if you want. Um, but what's the main takeaway? So we have about half an hour. And I do want you, I'm going to put you in breakout group, groups. And this time, I want each of you to formulate a question. And then we'll come back and I'll answer your questions, right? So before it was assuming you knew stuff, you thought about it, and you had comments about applying it. This time I've first introduction that um, you can, it's fine to have questions. Just make sure you have good questions and they're questions that are gonna get you, help you understand it better. Um, so be proactive in your groups. You know, the more proactive you are, the more you're intellectually engaged in your group, the easier it is to do your post. So I think you have an incentive to stay on task and to um, figure out, right? And somebody needs to be the spokesperson in each group. And um, let's see, I think, um, any other questions? I just want to put you in groups and I want you to have questions and then we'll come back in about 10 to 15 minutes. And if you're ready before that, I think you can, can you indicate that to me? You can indicate to me when your group is done and that's fine. So let me put you in the breakout rooms and then I'll check my chat. It has like 44 things on it. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Professor, could you please check? What? Let's see. Okay, so um, one reason I put you in breakout rooms is just because it's three hours and I, I want you to have, you know, some time to digest something and react to it. Um, and the problem with just troubleshooting different questions, um, yeah, okay, and is, um, they're, you know, they don't necessarily connect it at all. Whereas in a breakout group, you might be able to make some connections between the different questions. But let me just ask you, okay, you go to college, you obviously in college, you learn how to reason, right? College is about reasoning. Well, what is reasoning? <laughs> what is that? And then in the different classes that you take, what kind of reasoning are you asked to do? Because the first day of class, your teacher defines the process, the method, how you're going to use your brain for this class. So there are lots of different views of reason, reasoning, whatever. And so scientific method is definitely probably the dominant one, but it is not the only one. And my point here is that scientific method carries with it a set of values, even if they deny it, right? Science always occurs within a cultural context. Um, and so these are the original cultural, these are the original debates about what science is what kind of reasoning science uses and how that should be connected to morals and values and culture. So the reason we study Kant is because there are many, many engineers 
Kant is the beginning of artificial intelligence, right? Because he separates reason from the world. And from there, you can get robots and uh, computer science, all that stuff exists just in the web or in your head. It's not natural. It doesn't necessarily have any connection back to nature. And so again, in the US, in the state that I just left, they, the, the legislators are the puppets of the billionaires. The billionaires, uh, especially recently, uh, are fossil fuel engineers. Engineers whose goal is to exploit oil and gas resources. So they need engineers for their fossil fuel industry. So they have passed legislation or they've introduced legislation that forces high school students to take a computer science class. They promote STEM, but the biology teachers do not have to teach evolution. They can teach creation. Well, what's the agenda there? The agenda is if you're teaching evolution and you're teaching the ecology and you're teaching biology and you're teaching that stuff, you're gonna end up with climate change is a real problem. You're gonna end up with a set of values that we've got to stop putting carbon into the air, right? But these people know that. So you don't have to teach that. You can teach creationism. You can be anti-biology, anti-science in that sense of science, right? So that you can take STEM courses and be a good engineer and go work for Shell Oil. Um, that's why we need to read Kant, because he's detached, right? The natural world can be used as a resource for human beings. Even animals can, right? If animals can be used, not arbitrarily, right? You don't just shoot them arbitrarily, but it's okay, obviously, to do animal experiments uh, for human well-being, because humans are of infinite worth. So it's definitely okay to exploit gas and oil, to extract it from the earth for human well-being. No problem. And the trouble is the conditions have changed, and but the ideology, the philosophy has not changed. So we do have lots and lots of engineers, artificial intelligence, computer scientists who are just, there's no connection between them being good at their jobs and environmental protection. Some of them might, as a matter of fact, care about it, but it doesn't make them better at their professions. And they probably, probably the best jobs and the most high paying jobs are still the fossil fuel industry. So again, we're just heading right off the cliff and we're doing it in the name of reason, right? Ah, in the name of morality, in the name of following the moral law and treating human beings as ends in themselves. So it kind of drives me nuts. Um, okay, let's see. What is, there was a chat here. Okay. Um, okay, so what did somebody say? Kant's philosophy, the one that reflects the nature of Americans, the freedom. Well, the thing is, Locke's philosophy represents Americans, but Kant's also reflects Americans and the notion of freedom, again, freedom is completely detached from this world and you impose it on yourself, okay? But John Locke also has a notion of freedom to work hard and 
exploit the land for your own well-being because you have a right to life, liberty, health, and property. So Locke, Locke's view is the one that our legal system is based on. But Kant is a lot of, you know, just the culture. Now, again, I'm not just talking about America, I don't think, right? I think we, a lot of people from developing countries came to America to get this high level of education. So engineering education, um, education in exploiting various ways to exploit nature. And then they go back and they teach their best and brightest. So I remember when I was in Indonesia, most of the, the best and brightest were educated in Europe or the US. And then they went back and they started to improve the, the colleges in Indonesia so they could start teaching their own people. But they did have all these Western concepts, uh, deconstruction and all this stuff. And I don't think it really served their countries very well. I think they're just trying to imitate the West and I, I don't, <laughs> especially when it comes to climate change, this is not the way to go. Um, but again, Europe is different. Euro the Europe, the European legal system has more respect for sustainability, but all right. So I'm gonna call each of your names and give you each a chance to ask a question. And if you want to pass, just say pass, that's fine. Um, but if you'd like to at least, the thing is we could say at least once every class, every person gets to ask me a question, but I really think it works better in your groups because it's more efficient. So you can talk, I mean, I don't like this, you know, everybody just relating to me is not nearly as efficient or complex as if you have a group leader and you can ask her and then she comes and then we, you can see if you're satisfied with that. But that's why I'd rather have the breakout sessions, but we'll see. Okay, Ashpia, do you have a question? Okay. Rihanna, do you have a question? Sorry, Professor, I'm new in this class. Um, so far, I don't have any question. Okay. Hadis, do you have a question? No, Professor, not yet. I'm in the next class. Okay. So, Ramisha, do you have a question? No, Professor. Okay. Shazneen, do you? No, Professor. Okay. Does the material make sense to you, Shazneen? Yes, Professor, it does. Okay. I know Shazneen is interested in a, in a career in environmental stuff, right, Shazneen? Yes, Professor. Okay, because you've had an interest in this for a while, can you understand why I would think it's important for you to understand the mindsets that you're up against? Yes, Professor, I actually do, because um, every, it's difficult to get anything done without approval of the general um, public, I guess. Yeah, okay, so, so it's very different than the goddesses, right? <laughs> yes, Professor. Yeah, it's kind of sad how different that is. Okay, this is definitely a male. This is fighting with the man who constructed all this stuff reason, you know, it's pretty male. Okay, Shristi. Yes, Professor. Um, I have one question like, um, uh, comparing both Locke and Kant, uh, was Kant like more into the religious stuff than Locke? Okay, very good question. Both of them were what you call deists. They did believe in God. They thought it was reasonable to give up, to think there's something beyond reason. And then, but they had a view of God that was consistent with the new science. Whereas the old view of God 
was tied to Aristotle's science. So people, they changed their idea of God, but they, they both believed in a God and the immortality of the soul, but they had a different model of what the kind of life God would want us to live, right? It's not entirely different. For it's it's similar, really. So Locke would say you work hard, you give the land value, you contribute to your society's economy, um, and that's God looks favorably on you. And Kant would say you act on the moral law, you always treat people as ends in themselves, um, and that's what God looks favorably on. Now those two can come together. Um, so when you're actually creating wealth, make sure that you pe treat people as ends. You don't just like slavery wouldn't go over too well. Um, but actually Kant, both Kant and Locke were racist. <laughs> Kant was super racist and they were both sexist. Uh, Kant much more than Locke. But anyway, we can, we could go into that. It is kind of interesting the way it all fits together. But yeah. for now, what? Yeah, it, it's it's really interesting. Okay, good. I, I'm glad that you understand, right? Sexism, racism, uh, cultural superiority complex, exploitation of nature, Western colonialism, all these things really are connected but among themselves, they all think, these guys think they're so virtuous and they're gonna change the world forever for the better, which I think is a bit arrogant, but you know, at the time, science was going to save us. Okay, Sandani, do you have a question? No, Professor. Okay, Tasneem? Yes, Professor, I have a question. Okay. Um, in Kant's treatment of animals, he said that only humans have self-conscious awareness, units of consciousness, but um, I'm, I do not fully agree to this because I believe if animals did not have self-conscious awareness, then um, they wouldn't know how to interact with humans or they would, uh, you know, they would just eat themselves up. How would they know that uh, they're not supposed to eat themselves and they're supposed to eat other animals or insects if they did not have self-conscious awareness? What do you think about this? Or what do you have to say about this? Well, actually, um, when we study the utilitarianism is when we really start debating, right? They actually thought human consciousness isn't fundamentally different from animal conscious. It's just more... Come, uh, there's just more of it, but the actual process of reasoning is the same. But with Kant, the particular kind of awareness, it's reason a priori. So animals do not think, they do not construct a set of moral laws. They do not construct a set of scientific laws. Um, that would be the difference, but Keep that thought in mind for when we start doing utilitarianism, okay, Dustin? Okay, Professor, I'll try to keep it in mind. Okay, Thank good. you. Thank you. Sure. Rossi, do you have something? I didn't have a question relating to Kent. I know that Kent's perspective on animal rights is that we should be kind to animals because in a way it's a reflection of humanity, but how about the butchers? whose job is to kill animals? Like, do they have a choice and a say in this? Well, they sh they, it's definitely okay to kill animals to, for humans to eat. They just shouldn't kill them brutally, right? Because that would sort of make them brutal. But if it's perfectly fine to eat animals. Oh, okay. Thank Does that you. make sense? Yes. I we was don't, just wondering that, like the butchers who kill the animals like every day, like what about them? Well, he would think it's possible to do it in a way that doesn't brutalize the person. 
like there are plenty of butchers who treat people really well, right? Yes, Professor. That would be it, right? That That's the difference. You can be a butcher and be perfectly respectful of human beings. There's just certain ways to treat animals that are gonna make you more likely to harm human beings. You don't have any direct duty to animals, remember? All of the rules about animals are as a means to learning how to respect humans. So definitely we can eat them. Also, um, Professor, I think there is a, it's also about their profession, like their job. Right. But I mean, the question is, should societies have that job or should everyone be vegetarian? I, he wouldn't think you had to be vegetarian. But uh, Professor, like does this kind of, um, this kind of argument really exist? I think it exists like everyone should be vegetarian or something. Well, I mean, if you look, we're going to read about how much carbon meat eating puts into the atmosphere. That's the reason that I'm vegetarian, although I, you know, I don't like the brutalizing treatment of animals, but but mostly it's incredible the methane and all that and we will talk about that, but yeah. I these are the things I hope you think about. So Jame, and again, if I'm brutalizing your name, you can repeat your name the way it really is supposed to be. No, Professor, I don't have any question. My name is Jamie. Jamie, okay. Yeah. Dilshad? No, Professor. Fahima? Fahima, she, her electricity goes up and down. I had her last term and she's in a tough area for that. Foreman, how about you? Okay, so um, yeah, I know at the beginning people are adding classes and dropping classes and I'm trying to keep track of this. Uh, but I really hope that I can't have as many office hours between now and I have class. No, Professor, I don't have any questions. Okay. But um, starting on Wednesday, your time, um, I will definitely have office hours. So I really, really want all of you to do all the work, right? in the next few days, you can't do it by the next class, but really by a week from today. Otherwise, it's just gonna become impossible for you to catch up. So I'll have office hours um, so that you can talk to me. If you wanna get together with other people in the class, right? You can have your own subgroup on your own, or you can have a subgroup that comes to the office hours with me. But if you know you were making creating these groups, that's fine. Um, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. So as a college professor, the reason I wanted to do college is because the concept of reason, the reason I wanted to study philosophy, this is the thing in your head that the best and the brightest in any society are trained to use their reason however the society defines that. And in America, it has been at the expense of the environment, serious problem. And I don't want people in developing countries to imitate us, but I think they are. And I think that's just gonna make it that much harder for us to you know, change our ways because our ways of thinking are really hard to change but our habits also. And so we have just three minutes, but I wanted to just say, to give you an example of what a post is like. So, and why I'm not telling you what to write in your post. There's too much there. There's so many ways you can connect the material 
but you must keep asking yourself, what do I think is important? How does that tie to what other, you know, what I've said before? I, you're creating an environmental ethic. You're creating a worldview, just like these guys created their worldview, the way everything fits together. So last time, last time I checked, there was one person who posted. And what struck her after the first class was the notion that if you have irrational habits, it will pollute your mind, right? You will deceive yourself or delude yourself just so you can be comfortable <laughs> with your habits. Don't do that to yourself, right? Like if you're, if she said, if you throw away plastic constantly, you will deny the problem and you will have a toxic mentality, right? It will poison your mind. So she quoted what I said, your mind is your greatest gift. Uh, try to be true to your mind, right? Um, now, Kant would say that too, but he has a very different idea of reason. And um, I do not agree with that a priori notion of reason. I think reason should be connected to the world, right? Like Aristotle thought. Um, but you need to know these people think that you need to know artificial intelligence has, has, you know, cut itself off from the natural world long ago. And then she said, oh yeah, she also said, when I talked about lifeboat ethics, I was anticipating what we're going to cover, that their philosophy was you control over population by educating women and her own mother. Uh, was uh, able to go to an NGO sponsored group that gave her birth control. And so her mother was able to control the number of children she had. And so she and her siblings have more opportunities, including her opportunity to go to college. So that's a great example. That it tells you why. Why doesn't Dr. Beck tell us what to say? Well, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't think of it. I. There's so much that each student can come up with that means a lot to them. And then I think it also educates us. Like, I think that's a great story. And I could never have assigned a student, you know, to say that. So that's why I give you a lot of freedom, but, it, but it's a difficult task, right? Developing a worldview is is serious work. It's not just any old thing, but that's that's the project. And so uh, it's time to go, but I will sit here. And if anybody wants office hours now, I can hang out until everybody's satisfied. If you feel like you've got to go catch up and start before you will start having questions, that's fine. I will have office hours after class next time. Just don't ask your questions during class. Like class has to be about that particular material. That's it. All right. Bye, Dr. Beck. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I know. Bye, Professor. Yeah, I know all of you want to succeed, and I do not want to, to frustrate you in that goal. Really, I want to facil facil facilitate it. So <laughs> I think I'm getting tired. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yep. Do we need to write a reflection for next class? Well, I yeah. You, you're supposed to do the one about Locke. About Locke? Okay, so we don't need to write about Kant. No, you're not. The first time I introduce anything, you, you're not supposed to write about it, right? I will put that in the post, but the, the way it works is that the last hour, hour and a half, I introduce the new stuff. Then the next class, we spend an hour on that, and then you can do the post so that you've, you've had a chance to digest it. Okay, so uh, when is the deadline? Well, for the last one, it would be, you know, maybe two days, maybe before. I mean, I'm not going to, uh, 
drive you crazy, but I would say get it done before the next class so you don't get behind. Okay, and the minimum word limit is 200 words, right? No, in the assignment, it says 500, I think. Okay, okay so I, I heard, I got it wrong, I guess. Okay, thank you so much. For sure. sure.